good and people. Sounds good. Well, thanks for your help. Well, it is 1030, and that means it's time for Brainstorming the Human Connection, brought to you by the South Dakota Humanities Council. My name is Lawrence Diggs. I'll be your host today and uh, inquisitor, <laughs> as it, as it may, may turn out. Um, I will remind you that this is an interactive program. In other words, the whole point is to have a discussion, uh, not just a lecture, so to speak. And so we, we look forward to and invite you all to join us with your questions, comments, uh, relative comments. <laughs> and we, we always, usually we get those or none, but, but uh, everybody's ideas are welcome. Everybody's ideas are uh, to be tossed around. And we're, here we let the ideas fight. We don't need to because it's more entertaining to watch the ideas fight. Then we, and we don't have to get banged up at all. And now what requires is we throw out the ideas and uh, don't attach our egos to it. And so if somebody says, oh, that's a, I don't get that, you know, that's okay. <laughs> you know, it may be more about the person who doesn't get it than your idea, but at any rate, it's the, it's the ideas that we let wrestle. Um, today, we're going to be talking about a very interesting uh, and, and a little bit different than we uh, normally, normally do. We're going to be talking about jackalopes now probably if you've been in south dakota at any time or even the midwest really you've probably seen some in your backyard but you didn't know what they were you know didn't know, have a name for them and so now we're going to have a discussion about where they came from and uh get to know a lot about them and in the process i think we're going to learn something about ourselves and our guest today is michael branch and he is the author of uh, uh, On the Trail to Jackalopes. And so he is uh, going to be talking to us about his journey in uh, exploring and, and discovering jackalopes. So welcome, Mike. Well, thank you guys very much for having me. South Dakota is absolutely core jackalope habitat. So this is really exciting for me to be with you guys. Thank you. It, it's, uh, you know, it, and it says a lot about our personality, to, you know, as a state, you know, uh, and how we see things, you know, that whole jackalope thing. Um, let's start off, Mike, by giving people the 50,000 foot elevator speech of who the heck is Michael Branch? <laughs> well, I teach at the University of Nevada, Reno, and I'm a writer. And my focus in my writing is on humor writing. I love stuff that's funny and also on science writing. And I try to put those two things together in my nonfiction, where I try to tell stories in ways that are fun and engaging, but that also sneak in a lot of stuff that help you to learn some things too. So um, yeah, so I'm a writer of creative nonfiction, a humor writer, an environmental writer, and I'm working out of Northern Nevada, right in the ecotone where the Great Basin Desert and the Sierra Nevada Mountains meet. And um, this book, On the Trail of the Jackalope, was published last year, and I went all over the West with it. And unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to make it to the South Dakota Festival of Books, but I really wanted to thank Jennifer Widman for all her work in um, uh, inviting me there. My, I've got some health issues with my daughter that are going to keep me at home, but um, I've been all over the West with the book, and it's been really, really fun. And I know you guys in South Dakota love jackalopes, so I did want to just tell you, I've, I've been in every state in the West with this book, except the Dakotas, and in every single state in the West, people tell me, oh, we invented the jackalope. It came from here. <laughs> um, but before we get started, too, I also really wanted to thank Colby Chris from um, your Humanities Council and Lawrence Diggs for being such a wonderful host. We had a great talk the other day. Uh, State Humanities Councils are really vital to the lives of our communities, and the people who run them do a ton of important work. So uh, thanks to you guys for having me. Well, thank you. So let's turn now to uh, the book, On the Trail to the Jackalope. And I think in order to, to, let's say, as we say, define terms for the discussion, what the heck is a jackalope? <laughs> uh, you know, the interesting thing is it actually comes in a lot of forms. The name jackalope 
makes it sound like a jackrabbit and an antelope. But when you see the hoax taxidermy mounts of jackalopes, they're usually made with cottontails and with mule deer antlers. But a jackalope is an imagined creature. And by the way, we've been making up imagined animals, especially in the American West, for hundreds of years. It's part of the storytelling tradition uh, in the West. So a jackalope is both an artifact, if you've ever been in a greasy spoon diner or a pool hall and looked up on the wall and saw that taxidermy mound, and instead of being a pronghorn or a deer, it was a little rabbit with antlers. So the jackalope is that physical artifact, but the this imagined mythical animal alive for almost 100 years in our culture. And I can share some of them with you later, but the point is that folk storytellers have been keeping the jackalope in our culture by telling their own stories and changing those stories and inventing new stories about the jackalope. So the easy answer is that a jackalope is a mythological creature that's a hybrid of a rabbit and a deer or an antelope. But the more interesting answer to the question, what is a jackalope, is that it's sort of a phenomenon in American folk culture that has been kept alive through storytelling. I, I would say that one other thing to introduce, because you, you said it's been part of our, our culture, that it, I, I, not the jackalope per se, but the idea goes way back to uh, chimeras, you know, where people would mix different animals and put them together and nobody ever saw them, but they became very real to people, you know, in, in terms of like, you know, men and bulls and all those kind of things. Um, and, you know, I, I think I've seen some of those people, you know, the way they, you know, they <laughs> well you're right you're right yeah, Lawrence, that yeah yeah i mean you, you they they do come they're all of them like people you know some of them are day people too <laughs> yeah hey i'm a sagittarius uh, so i can picture it uh, but but you're yeah, right there you go <laughs> these, these hybrid animals have existed in folk cultures all over since the beginning of time what i find so cool and interesting about this is you know there's a chapter in the book where i talk about this of the chapter is the necessary monster, which is a term that I borrow from the Argentinian writer Jorge Luis Borges, who has this idea of the necessary monster. He basically says, well, why is it that across all of time and all of the globe, every culture has its monsters, has its imagined creatures that live on that edge of the community, just out beyond what we know about the world? And so you're right that a lot of these creatures are hybrid. They cross boundaries. They they blur boundaries. Uh, but also, it's just such an interesting thing to think about when you think of how vast cultural differences are in both indigenous and settler cultures around the world. And yet we have this one thing in common, you know, we have our monsters. So we have Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster or whatever. Uh, and the jackalope is in that tradition, right? It looks like it could be real. And people who aren't familiar with the hoax, when they first see that mount on the wall, they often fall for it, right? It looks like it's real. And yet it isn't. So it exists in that kind of liminal zone between the real and the imaginary. And I'm fascinated by the idea that every culture needs to have these imagined animals that live in that weird space between what we know and what we imagine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, let's talk about the book. And before we get into that, though, let me just say, we do have a chat. If you have a question down at the bottom of your screen, there should be a a little uh, bubble with a little point onto it where indicating it's a chat. Uh, and if you click on that, uh, you can see uh, the the different uh, links that uh, Colby puts on, puts on the, in the chat. And you can also go down to the bottom of it and there's a little smiley face and right next to the smiley face, uh, you, you will see three dots. And those three dots, will, if you click on those, you can actually, download all of those links and people's people's questions, et cetera, to your computer. So if you have a question and you're too shy, I know well, some of you are quite shy. Yeah, if, you're, if you're too shy, you can just put your question or your comment in and then we'll, we'll, try, to, uh, we'll try to get to it. So let's go back now to, to the book before I so rudely interrupted you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no problem at all. It, it really was a super fun project. I got interested in it because as a humor writer and a writer about the American West, I just got curious about, 
you know, I would see jackalope bumper stickers and t-shirts and shot glasses and, you know, where, where did the thing come from? So the impetus for the book originally <clears throat> was to try to dig into the kind of folk history of this thing and figure out where it came from and how it got perpetuated and disseminated. But then over the course of the project, you know, things got a lot more complicated. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm giving a little bit away here about the book, but I think it's important just to give you guys a sense of context that the, the surprise pivot in the middle of the book is, hey, we've been talking about horned rabbits, the mythology of them, the fact that they're these weird imagined creatures. But it turns out that, quote unquote, horned rabbits actually exist in nature. And what they are are regular rabbits that develop these weird growths on their head as a result of infection with a virus. So in the last third of the book, I start to investigate, well, is there a possibility that these actual weird horned in the natural world may have inspired some of these myths about horned rabbits? Because in the American or jackalope, but horned rabbits exist in the mythology and folk culture of of people from around the world. And that seems pretty weird. You know, how did everybody come up with the idea of horned rabbits? So the book takes a turn kind of from folklore towards science and tells the story of how the study of these virus stricken rabbits eventually led to the development of the HPV vaccine. So the most powerful, most effective anti treatment that we've ever created would without actual horned rabbits. So the book is doing both things. It's having fun with the jackalope, the horned rabbit that we invented. And it also is looking at the biology of these actual rabbits in the natural world and how their study was important to cancer research. And, and so that gives you a sense of what I was talking about earlier about my interests as a writer. How can I use narrative and humor to get people engaged in a story that ultimately is going to include a lot of science? So it sounds like your book is kind of like a jackalope itself, right? Yes. And by the way, uh, editors and trade presses hate this. Um, I've spent a career writing books that were weird hybrids. Um, and, yeah. you know, the, the thing is the publisher essentially just wants to know who do we market this to? What shelf do we put it on? And that's a very interesting proposition when you talk about jackalopes, right? Because... Yeah. It's not like, oh, I wrote a book about birds. You should market it to the Audubon Society. Like where, you know, where are the jackalope people out there? It turns out they're everywhere. But if you're in marketing at a New York trade press, you know, I mean, I, I often joke about what I call the view from the Hudson, right? The publishing industry is dominated by New York. These people can't see South Dakota. They can't see Nevada. They don't know how we live. They don't know our stories. They don't believe we read books, you know, all of that, right? So, um, it, it's been an it's been an interesting journey. Um, but yeah, the that interests me the most as a writer is where things come together in strange and surprising ways. That's the stuff I love to write about, even though from a commercial point of view, you know, this this just drives me crazy because you know, well, what is this book about? Is it a humor book or is it a folklore book or is it a science book? And yes, right, yes. Um, yes. So it, it's been it's been one of the most fun books to write, in part because I got to travel around the West and interview a lot of inter interesting and and funny people, and I just learned so much along the way. It, it's been a I was going to uh, add that to your point about the marketing people, it's very interesting that marketing is supposed to be really a creative environment. But some of the least creative people you will ever meet <laughs> are in marketing, especially when they get into the bean counting era. It's like it's like those guys and gals can't see anything. You know, it's like and they don't have they don't know real people. They, uh, they only know other marketers. So if they talk to their friends over a drink about something and nobody can get it, then they figure nobody in the world gets it. Yeah. <laughs> so That's they, a they don't get they, they apparently don't get out much, you know. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right, Lawrence. And and what really strikes me the most about it isn't just the kind of what you'd expect, the, the hyper commercialization and the bean counting. It's it's the part that really interests and frustrates me the most is the regional part. The, the fact that, mm -hmm. you know, if you talk to people in the publishing industry in New York City about the West, you know, they picture people surfing in California or they picture like some guy on a dude ranch 
But the Intermountain West, where we live, where you guys live and where I live in Nevada, you know, this is like a total mystery to, to these folks. They don't have the slightest what the life is like, what the people are like, what our storytelling traditions are like. And so, uh, yeah, like I pitched, I pitched a book to my agent recently. <clears throat> Long story short, it was a book about walking. I won't go into detail. And so she she thought about it for a while and she said, well, maybe if it was a book about walking in New York City. <laughs> and I just said, never mind, let's move on. Next yeah, idea. Right. Yeah, um, right, right, right. <laughs> well, that's it's it's interesting that to see that, you know, the more people are different, the more they're the same. You know, it's like people talk about people in South Dakota or Roslyn and then saying, oh, those people don't get out much. I got news for you. <laughs> Some people in the big cities. They don't get out much either. Oh, <laughs> Most yeah. Most people I, don't get out much. <laughs> no, I, I agree with you completely. So tell us what the book is about. Well, you know, it, it is about this weird cultural phenomenon of, of the horned rabbit and how it came about. I tell the origin story of teenagers in a rural Wyoming town who came up with the first taxidermy mount during the Great Depression back in the 1930s. And then I kind of look at how it spread from there. And, uh, you know, that was really the one of the most fun parts of the project for me was to figure out, follow it, its origin story. Where did it come from? Um, and that really cool and fun. And I got to, you know, travel to rural Wyoming and interview people about this. And it was it was just I learned so much. I had a great time. But I also, you know, as a student of American culture, I'm just really interested, too, in how do these things get disseminated? How do they move through the culture? Right? How do they um, kind of get a, a toehold in a world where there are so many things competing for our attention? And what really got me started with the project was, you know, I just started seeing jackalopes everywhere, as I mentioned, you know, and, uh, you know, bumper stickers and the names of restaurants, and you know, they just suddenly seemed to be everywhere. And I was at my local brew pub, and I saw a woman lift a pint of ale, on her shoulder, she had a jackalope tattoo. And I said, okay, this has gone too far. I got to figure this thing out. Where, where did this come from? And, and it's kind of neat because during the 19th century in the West, you know, this before we had, you know, electronic media, storytelling was the main form of entertainment. You know, Mark Twain's culture was a culture of storytelling. Native cultures in the West, African-American people in the West, you know, storytelling was a form of cultural communication, but also entertainment. And so I just found fascinating that we invented all these weird animals in the 19th century, but we wouldn't remember any of their names now, like a dunga hoover or a side hill gouger, or, you know, there were hundreds of these things. But the jackalope has stuck going on in the culture. And I really was curious about why. And so that was fun to try to ask, you know, how is it that in a world where there's so much competition for our attention, we still love jackalopes enough alive through storytelling, through art. Um, and, and that was a part of the book too, was to talk with artists and filmmakers and songwriters and who use the jackalope in their work. Because when I say that the jackalope is part of our folk culture, you know, one way to kind of make this distinction clear is, you know, compare the jackalope as a character that we tell stories about to say Disney, a Disney character. Those Disney characters, there are there are armies of uh, intellectual property lawyers who protect those characters. And in fact, there was even a case where a preschool once painted Disney characters on the fence in front of their school, and they got a cease and desist letter from the Disney Corporation. So, you know, <laughs> there's there's that idea of like controlling and monetizing these uh, characters, right? But nobody owns the jackalope. So if you wake up tomorrow morning and decide you want to write a song about a tell a jackalope story, or you want to take a jackalope joke that you've heard and change it, or you want to make a painting, that jackalope is ours collectively. And so one of the things I do in the book is I have the beautiful color insert with many, many images of paintings that have been made of the jackalope. And you can see the styles just are all over the map in terms of how these artists have chosen to interpret this phenomenon. So part of what I really love about it, and it's it sounds simple, but it, to me, it's actually quite profound. Nobody owns the jackalope. And as a result, 
Nobody needs to license it. Nobody needs permission for it. Nobody polices how it's represented. You know, the jackalope is ours and we can tell whatever stories about it we want. And I think that's one of the reasons that it's managed to keep a toehold in popular culture, even as we're barraged with all these other forms of entertainment. Right. And as a result, you don't see free the jackalope stickers. You know? <laughs> well, <laughs> they're already had, free. Yeah, They're already free. I like that. Yeah, I like that. Um, you do see yeah, a lot of save, range. save the jackalope. Um, you yeah. see that one a lot. So people yeah. come to come to my readings in their save the jackalope t-shirts. And it always makes me yeah. laugh because, you know, the only thing that can endanger a jackalope <clears throat> is if we quit telling stories about it. Otherwise, it's going to be just fine. Yeah. Yeah. The bad memories are the boon of society, you know. So, <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the development of the book. But before we get into that, how about some questions from the audience? Anybody have questions, comments, uh, uh, relevant stories? Uh, do you have a jackalope? You know, and have feel, you ever seen jackalope? Yeah, feel free to <clears throat> feel free to share your jackalope sighting narratives. That's been one of the cool about this book as I travel is sometimes people have questions, but a lot of times they just want to say, hey, let me tell you about the first time yeah. I saw a jackalope. Uh, so okay. I'm happy to hear those stories too. <laughs> Anybody? Jackalope stories, questions? Going once, going twice. I had uh, something oh, I was going to say. Um, I was on a garden site and I, I put an image of a bee up there and, and somebody responded and they said, you know, that's not a real bee, that's AI. And I was kind of embarrassed. And then I, then I was reading about what you had said about conning somebody or um, having a lighthearted, uh, uh, appeal. It, it's not meant to hurt someone. And I think uh, I just thought in this day and age when AI takes hold, uh, oh, no one will know oh, what's real. Back. Okay. Go ahead, Vicki. I said no one will really know what's real or what isn't. And, um, and I thought, uh, you know, the book of Revelation and uh, the Bible has lots of those things. And there must be a, a need and I would hope in the future we wouldn't be so tainted with AI of not believing that we could still incorporate this uh, fantasy wonderful world that, that lightens the load of life. I, I thought that was good that you talked about that. That is a really, really smart and helpful comment, Vicki. I appreciate that because it is true that I, I would say in interviews about the book, probably the most awkward thing has been people saying, hey, we live in an era, <clears throat> excuse me, we live in an era of disinformation and manipulation and hoaxes. And mm -hmm. here you are kind of like sticking up for this thing that essentially can be used to fool people. And, <clears throat> you know, the two points that I always make about that, and Vicki, you've made one just now beautifully, and that is, well, the world is more than what we know of it, right? Our imaginations are crucial to the way we interact with the world. And when we read a novel, we don't say, well, that's worthless because it's not real. It can still be true, right? And mm -hmm. so I think, you know, making room in the way we think about what's real for the work of the imagination for our poets and our musicians and painters and filmmakers is really, really important. But then the other thing that I specifically try to emphasize about the jackalope is, you know, I make the distinction between a, a hoax and a con. So a con mm -hmm. is when you want to take advantage of somebody, right? You want their money, their power, their self-respect. And the perfect con is the one that's never, nobody ever finds out and you get what you wanted to take from the other person. But a hoax, at least in the traditional, hoaxes go back millennia in all kinds of world cultures. The point of a hoax is to have a bunch of fun and then bring somebody over into your community. So when the jackalope is used as a hoax, when it's used to fool people, it's not used to fool them forever. It's used to fool them for a little while and then let them have the pleasure discovering what this is really all about, after which they come over into the community of people who are in on the joke. And you know that is actually a powerful community tool 
And mm -hmm. there are versions of this all over the world. I'll just give you a quick story as one of my very favorites is in, in Bavaria, in the wooded mountainous part of Germany, they have a horned rabbit in their culture, their, in their mythology, and it's called a Volpertinger. And so I'm interviewing these Bavarian people about the Volpertinger. And I say, well, you know, what's, what's the most important about your culture's rabbit? And they say, oh, definitely the Volpertinger hunt. That's the big deal, right? And okay, so tell me about the Volpertinger hunt. How does that work? And they say, well, you know, in our village, when a kid gets to be around 15, 16 years old, a hunting culture you know we oh, it's time for you did we lose him mike i think we i, I don't know if you can hear us but uh we kind of lost you you froze and we we get no no voice Well, you'll probably you'll probably have to uh, drop out and re reboot. But in the meantime, um, do you guys have any other other um, uh, stories about uh, jackalopes? I guess I could add one. Uh, sure. <clears throat> I'm a geologist, and I live in Vermilion, South Dakota. And mm -hmm. uh, oh, several years ago, I I in a group of other geologists went out to the Black Hills area for studying some things out in the Badlands. And on the way back, we stopped at a restaurant in Mitchell, South Dakota, where there happens to be a jackalope uh, monument thing in the, in the front yard of the, the uh, restaurant. <clears throat> and it's there for kids to mount up and get their picture taken on the jackalope. Well, my colleagues uh, coaxed me in a moment of weakness on my part to jump on the, uh, the jackalope for a few pictures. And so I did. And I should have known better because I'd earlier had a similar picture of me kissing a pig while I was on a hogs, bogs, and logs field trip in Iowa. Uh, but anyway, about two years, three years later, when this same group was at a national meeting, we were all at a national meeting in Denver, uh, one of the participants that was with us uh, popped up a picture of me in this meeting with 500 geologists in it uh, on astride the jackalope and described us both as, as uh, mythical elusive creatures that are seldom photographed so 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 we so there was a, we so and then I, they said I the jackalope to, is real <laughs> yes i was able to get acquainted with 500 uh geologists uh, uh, uh some of them many of them i knew before but uh and uh, i had uh, my talk was just right after that one so it was <laughs> sort of an introduction for me yeah, that's that's right. a that is a great story, Dick. I'm sorry that I, I got cut out for a second, but I heard enough of that to love it. And, and part of what I love about that, right, is when you said you got to know all these geologists as a result, uh, the jackalope brings people together. It just makes them smile. It makes them laugh. And uh, it, like a lot of humorous things, it creates a sense of community. So I, I love that story. And by the way, um, the and you guys will probably know this in South Dakota, but you know, one of the interviews I did was with the Husted family who own Wall Drug in South Dakota. And out in the back behind Wall Drug, there is a big plexiglass jackalope. And when I was asking, um, you know, Rick and Sarah Husted, the family who own Wall Drug, uh, well, you know, how long has it, that jackalope been there and all this? Uh, Rick said, yeah, somebody proposes marriage to, to their girlfriend on that jackalope almost every summer. And so, you know, then that takes on a kind of life of its own, which I, I really loved. Uh, there also, by the way, is a big jackalope like the one you described, Dick, uh, in, a, in a dive bar called the Jackalope down in Austin, Texas. And uh, one of the most fun nights of field work I ever had was sitting sober in a bar in Austin, Texas with my journal, watching people at two or three in the morning uh, try to climb up onto that jackalope for pictures. And there were plenty of accidents. It was pretty entertaining. 
But thank you for sharing that story, Dick. And that's part of what's so fun about the jackalope is just that so many of us have these kinds of stories. That that was a great one. I loved it. But you were in the middle of a story before you were so rudely interrupted <laughs> about Bavarians and, yeah, uh, and, and their, their version of a jackalope. Yeah, so sorry, we got disconnected. Yeah, so essentially I was saying that there's this rite of passage uh, in rural Germany in the forest. And so they take the kid out in the field, I'd mentioned with the stick and uh, sack and the stick. The hunters then say, okay, we're going to go drive the jackalopes toward you. And of course, they all just go back to the hunting lodge and start drinking. And the whole gag is how long will it take before this kid who's standing alone out in this moonlit field in the forest, you know, puts it together. And at first that might sound a little bit cruel, right? But the way this works is, of course, the kid figures it out, comes back to the hunting lodge. And the minute that young man walks into the lodge, they are embraced and songs are sung and there's a meal and there are special rituals around it. And so, yeah, they've been fooled. It is a hoax. But the whole point of that hoax now is to bring them over into the community of people who are in on the joke. And uh, I, I just thought that was a really great example of how when you hear hoax, you tend to think, oh, somebody is going to be hurt by it or exploited. Um, but in the way I intend hoax and the way hoaxes have been used traditionally, it's usually to have good fun, but ultimately to build a sense of community. And, and when I interviewed the mayor of Douglas, Wyoming, which is the little town in rural Wyoming where the jackalope was invented back in the 30s, the way he put it to me was, <clears throat> well, first of all, he said, yeah, I go to these mayor's conferences in Washington, D.C., and I just hand out postcards of jackalopes and I say, please, you know, come visit. We'll go jackalope hunting together. And and I said to him, do they really fall for this? And he said, hey, it's D.C. They don't know anything about Wyoming. So, you know, <laughs> he was having a lot of fun with it. But the way uh, he put it, the, the mayor of Douglas, Wyoming, put it to me that I thought was perfect is he said, we're a whole town with an inside joke. We're all in on it. But the other people who visit us aren't in on it until they visit us and then they get to be part of it too. And I, I just love that idea of, you know, building community through humor. Right. I think that is a very important point is that when people have a shared experience, like those kids had it, all those adults probably had the same thing played on them. And so that's almost like an initiation, you know, it's like, and so now you're really part of us. You, you Maybe not an adult, but you're about as close as you're going to get before we accept you into the crew. Just the yeah. fact that we wanted to play that on you means that we accept you. It, yeah. It's exactly right, Lawrence. And that's the beautiful way to put it. And so many people have told me these intergenerational jackalope stories. And I think probably the most common version is, you know, somebody will come up to me and say, I really want to tell you about the time my grandfather took me on a jackalope hunt when I was 13. You know, and we went out and he marched me all over and he told me exactly how to, do, you know, so the point is, it's like my story about the, the Wolpertinger in Bavaria, that there's a whole ritual around it. But ultimately, it's a ritual of care, just as you say, Lawrence, like we care enough about you to make you the center of attention. And yeah, you'll have to learn to laugh at yourself a little bit and not take yourself too seriously. But then ultimately, you're going to be welcomed into this group and you're going to have the good fun of doing this for the next person, right? So I really like that idea that some of these rituals have been going on for generations. Right. Well, you know, one of the other ideas that you you brought that is uh, probably worth exploring is, in a sense, we talk about uh, parallel universes in physics and things like that. But I think we we carry those parallel universes in our head. You know, each of us have a universe that all of the things come together in a particular kind of way. And then communities have that. And then uh, larger communities right up to nation states, they end up creating mythologies and mutual uh, kind of like understandings. And they, they kind of fall apart as the, as the groups get bigger. But they all sort of play a part in the glue that allows us to think of the thing as an entity, you know, just like a, a nation state has to have a flag and a song and stuff. It's, it's all complete hoax, but it's what allows us to think of ourselves as 
a nation. It allows us, uh, our own universe allows us to think of ourselves individually as a person. This is who I am. This is what I believe. This is what I'm all about. That universe is, you know, the thing that, that we live in all the time. It's the one that we are probably most familiar with. That said, the one that we can operate in is one that is a mutual reality. All the things we shared. So some, you get back to the jackalope, and I think it's probably that struggle to create a mutual uh, reality, something that we can we can believe in, but also reminds us that well, it, we all we make all these realities up. So I think that it it's on a lot of level this this idea of the jackalope. Uh, has meaning. Yeah, that that's a really interesting way to look at it. And when you talk about it that way, what it makes me think of, Lawrence, is just this idea that our what what we see as real is very often the product of our own stories about what we think is real. Right? That narrative is our oldest technology as a species. And I think it's really kind of interesting, right? That think of other animals, and we are at everything they're stronger, they hide better, they climb trees, they can water, they can fly. The two things we do really well are narrative and bipedalism, telling stories and walking upright. Those are the two things that we're actually really, really good at. And so I think it's fun to think about the fact that, you know, in Native American traditions, for example, there is often just an assumption that reality is created by stories, that the world that we see around us was the product of narrative. And, you know, that's literally in many indigenous cosmologies. You know, for us, we see it as a metaphor, but is it, you know, is it really a metaphor or isn't it kind of true, yeah. right? That the stories we tell about ourselves and about each other end up constituting who we think we are as individuals yeah. and families and communities, states, you know, nation states, as you point out. So, you know, I really love that idea that we're we're made of stories. It's, it's the one thing that we are really, really good at. And you know, I think of a Barry Lopez, the environmental writer who who died just a few years ago, had this wonderful quote that uh, he used to always share. And Barry would say, "Hope and stories; those are the two things that hold us together. There's nothing else. Hope and stories." And I, I just right. think that's a really beautiful way to think about it. So, yeah, I love this idea that we're we're always constituting our reality through what kinds of stories we tell about it. And part of what's cool about the jackalope is the way it gets to exist out, out on the fringe of that, right? And just let us with that boundary between the real and the imagined. Mm -hmm. uh, Tricia says mm -hmm. that she's from Israel and she, she can attest that the jackalope is still there. <laughs> she said they had an award-winning uh, trivia team uh, for a while and we called ourselves the East River Jackalopes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm you glad know, to I read a little clip uh, yesterday and, um, you know, so many people are looking for meaning in life. And it said, uh, it, it was very simple. It said, you know, there is no meaning in life. We live to create meaning. And I thought that was really profound that life itself, your responsibility is to create this wonderful world of meaning because we get a little bit lost when we think, you know, what's the meaning of life? What's my purpose? And, and I thought that was a, a wonderful way. Then it in, encourages you to uh, really explore on what your responsibility is to being a living person and, and bringing goodness into the world. I, I really love that, Vicki, and it, it's really close to a quote that has inspired me a lot, which is that art is the struggle to make meaning of experience. And so for me as a writer, you know, oftentimes people think, well, writers, they're people who know stuff, and then they use writing to convey that stuff. And I always say, actually, writers are people who use this practice to try to figure stuff out. So for example, when I'm writing about my relationship with my daughters, or I'm about Great Basin Desert. Um, I'm not. I'm not a reporter. I'm not a journalist. Just you know, saying here's what I know, and I'm going to tell you. I'm using the process of writing to try to understand those places and those people and my relationship to them. So I love the way you put that, Vicky. That you know, it isn't that 
you know, we're going to finally open the right treasure chest or flip over the right rock and there will be the meaning of life. It's that constant daily reminder that, you know, we create the meaning of our lives through how we engage with them. And that often that's not a giant epic thing. It's sort of like every morning when we wake up, how we choose to live our life, how we treat other people, how we feel about our families. Uh, those are the things that create the meaning of our lives. And whatever they are is a product of a lot of choices that we make. And often there are a lot of small choices. Anybody who's a parent, you know, understands that, right? That the meaning of your relationship with your kids is not created on some perfect day. It's created in a zillion tiny moments every single day. And the awareness that you're suggesting, Vicky, that we kind of bring to that, I think is really, that's really, to me, that's really inspiring. And that's why I keep writing is to try to figure this stuff out for myself. Yeah. You know, that's an age old uh, quandary uh, or question that people have had is reality uh, discovered or created, you know, and the, and depending on where in that spectrum you fall, uh, you will have a whole different point of view about what your what your meaning in life is. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, the whole idea of the narrative is part and parcel of that especially when it's uh, a uh, gets into fiction you know and uh even in in non-fiction too you know that that's a thing because you choose which things and which facet of that thing you're going to talk about that's right and in so doing you you create the thing not just in what you say but all the things you don't say and probably shouldn't say without because at the risk of making the whole thing unintelligible but you you it's kind of like a sculpture a sculptor taking off the wood to reveal the thing you know or another sculpture putting the wood on to make the thing you know so and they yeah. both are sculptors yeah i love that and and you're really right that there are different ways to go about this, but that ultimately, you know, that's something in the nonfiction writing classes that I teach at the university that we talk about a lot is people really assume, okay, fiction is all made up and nonfiction is just reporting. But the art of nonfiction, just as you say, Lawrence, you know, what do you leave out? What do you put in? What do you compress? How do you shape it? What narrative voice do you bring to your work? Um, you know, you're making artistic choices all the time about how to tell a story. And so one way to think about that that I've found helpful is, you know, when you're reading a novel or a short story, you think about a narrator, right? Is it a first person narration? Is, you know, what's the narrator like? So the writer creates the narrator, then the narrator tells the story. But nonfiction also has a narrator. And a good way to think about this is, you know, think about how you talk to your colleagues at work, how you talk to your neighbors, how you talk to your relatives at Thanksgiving how you talk to the police officer that pulls you over for speeding. You're gonna to speak to each of those people in a little bit of a different voice. Those, those voices are all still you, but you're choosing a particular way of presenting yourself and telling a story. And in creative nonfiction, it's the same thing. You have to choose a narrator who can help you tell the truth about your life experience, but do it in an artful and effective way. So just as an example, you know, um, a lot of my work not so much in the Jackalope book, but the three books before that, uh, you know, are essentially humor books. And so the narrator that I've chosen for those books, you know, he's a little more fun than I am. He's a little funnier than I am. He's a little wilder than I am. And often when I'm on the road with those books, you know, people will come up to me and say like, hey, after the reading, let's go drink whiskey all night long and, you know, skinny dip in the lake. And I'm like, I'm going home to watch a baseball game in the hotel room. You're talking about my narrator, not me. I want to go have a beer and watch a baseball game and go to sleep. So anyway, that gap, <laughs> that gap between the author and the narrator is really a fun way to conceptualize exactly what you're talking about, Lawrence. Mm -hmm. Well, let's get back to uh, your experiences for writing the book. I have a feeling that that's as interesting as a jackalope. <laughs> it, it really was neat. Um, like a lot of writers, I tend to be kind of reclusive and focused. I like to, I'm, a, I'm very nerdy and I like to do a lot of research around my projects and, you know, be deeply focused. One of the things I love about writing is that the things about day-to-day -day life, whether it's politics or, you know, whatever your stressors are, 
when I'm writing, I kind of forget about that stuff. And so for me, it's a really healthy practice. So I tend to be kind of a solitary writer. But on this Jackalope book, I, I just had to interview lots and lots of people. And I was kind of dreading it, frankly, because I'm not a journalist. I don't, that's not part of my practice. It, it transformed my experience. It turns out that that was the best part of writing the book. And I came out of this book saying, I absolutely will never write another book that doesn't involve a lot of interviews because I met so many fascinating people. I learned so much. Um, I got to be in a listening role a lot instead of a speaking role. And then in terms of the craft of nonfiction, when I went to write the book, I was able to let all these other voices help me tell the story. And so, you know, the, traveling around the West was really fun, uh, meeting a lot of different people, but there, there were a lot of aspects of the book that were really challenging and gratifying. But I think to me, the most transformative for me as a person and as a writer was discovering that even though I might be nervous interviewing a person, because uh, it's not part of my usual practice, uh, you know, I made some wonderful friendships with people and I learned a lot of new ways of seeing the world. So uh, the the whole arc of the book for me was a really long journey, but I would really kind of highlight that dimension that I've talked about the jackalope being a building agent and it really worked that way for me. You know, by the time I was done with this book, I had this huge network of people all over the world uh, scientists, folklorists, you know, Bigfoot hunters. I mean, you know, all these wacky folks who were so smart and interesting. And I, I still keep in touch with a lot of them. So it ended up being not just um, writing a book, but helping to kind of build a community around this. And I still, I get emails, maybe not every day, but three, four, five times a week from people I don't know who say, you don't know me, but I hear you're the jackalope guy. And I want to tell you this story. And it's just a beautiful thing, you know, um, um, many of my previous books, people have enjoyed them and I move on to the next book and, you know, here we go. But, you know, I'm, I'm moving on to other projects, but the world is still full of jackalope enthusiasts who want to talk to me and tell me their stories and ask me questions. And so the way the book functioned for me to community of people, uh, it, it really not only was it cool and fun, but it gave me hope at a time when there's a lot to despair about because it showed me that we can build community. If you can build a community around a jackalope, you can build a community <laughs> around anything, right? I mean, yep. you know, so that was really encouraging to me to see, you know, people can come together around interests they share and enjoy uh, and, and be part of something larger than them. And that was how it felt to me working on the book. It, it just was a really neat experience. Can you talk a little bit about the kinds of things that you learned, you know, about yourself, about communities, things that are, may or may not be directly connected with the jackalope itself, but uh, it, it, the process of, in the process of writing the book, what kind of things did you learn? That's a great question, Lawrence. Um, there's so much to say, but I'll, I'll just give you one example of something that has meant a lot to me. Uh, and that is when I set out to write about the jackalope, I naively assumed that I would research this phenomenon and then I would report on what the deal was. Hey, have you ever wondered about jackalopes? I'll, I'll, I'll go learn about it and I'll tell you the story. And instead, what I found, and we've already talked about this a little bit today in terms of narrative and community, but what I found was the jackalope is not a single phenomenon that I can just learn about and describe because it means something different to everybody. And so the way I put it in the book is the jackalope is both a window onto the culture. That is, if we look at, you know, why do people love jackalopes? Okay, we can learn something about our culture. But the jackalope is also a mirror and each person sees something really, really different in it. And, you know, that's the thing that really struck me the most was that my story needed to be not what is the jackalope, but why is there this incredible range of creative responses to it? Why does it mean such different things to such different people? So for those of you who've read the book, you know that one of the uh, structural techniques I use is that at the end of every single interview, and I seriously, I can be interviewing like, you know, a nutty cryptozoologist, or I can be interviewing a world-class epidemiologist, 
no matter who I'm talking to, the last question in my interview is always, why do you think people love jackalopes? And what's cool is over the arc of the book, you see this accretion of different answers to that question. And people's answers are so different from each other. I mean, if I, I just like have this fantasy of a focus group of jackalope enthusiasts around a table, and they would go in there thinking they all love the jackalope for the same reasons, and they would leave that room saying, oh, I had no idea. And so what I learned was that my story wasn't about a thing. My story was about people and their range of different responses to the jackalope. So I had everything from, you know, people who said, I'll tell you what, I love the jackalope, but the problem with the jackalope in the culture is people think rabbits are cute. And I think jackalopes are, you know, murderous assailants. And I want to tell stories about how they eviscerate people and eat their intestines in the woods at night. Okay, that's like one person's jackalope. And then, you know, I mentioned that, you know, the mayor of Douglas, Wyoming, his, his wife, lovely woman, you know, she said, I grew up in Douglas and the jackalope was more important to us than Santa Claus or the Easter bunny. And I'll never forget the day that my grandmother had to tell me that the jackalope didn't exist. We used to leave oats out for the jackalope at night and it meant so much to us. And, you know, when my grandmother had to tell me that jackalopes didn't exist, that was one of the hardest days of my life. And the woman is literally has got tears in her eyes telling me this story. And here I had come in like, hey, I'm a humor writer. This jackalope thing's going to be a hoot. And I realized, oh my God, this, this person's life has been touched by this in a way that I never imagined. And so, you know, as I interviewed artists and storytellers and just regular folks, um, you know, people would say, the jackalope means so much to me because when I was a kid, my grandfather used to take me to the VFW hall and I got to hear all these stories from he and his friends about, you know, their experience or two. And there was a jackalope there. And that's what that that's what it has always meant to me. And anyway, so you get the point. I could proliferate these examples forever. But uh, I think the most important thing I learned was that the story wasn't about the thing. The story was about the story and that the story itself was created not by me or by, you know, a stuff you know, taxidermy animal. It was created by this incredible range of different people from different walks of lives, each of whom was interacting with this weird phenomenon in a very different way. And it, it actually changed my whole view of my work as a writer. I, I hope I can really carry that insight forward with me into other projects. So I'm, I'm working on a new book now, and I'm just trying to remember the story isn't about the thing, the story is about the people and how they make the thing meaningful through the way they interact with it. Mm -hmm. I think those are some of the most important things about being a writer is the kind of insights, especially when you're 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 exploring and you're researching. You, you know, you go on a, a, a chasing something, and it's the it becomes the journey, not what you find. It's all of the things you find along the way that you didn't know that you didn't know. You know, yeah, that's um, that's a that's a great way to put it. Yes, uh, you know, I I'm uh, working on another project uh, right now that is very similar to this uh, to our jackalope conversation, or it, it ties in well. Uh, I'm working with a with a musical group, and we're doing uh, stories of uh, Asian horror stories. And one of the things that I learned in researching because I'm rewriting these stories so that they fit the, the format that we have. And one of the things I, I found was how often the stories change from not only country to country as they move from India to China to you know, Korea to Japan, et cetera, but also from village to village and from storyteller to storyteller, there was a little bit of morphing of the story. So it, it gives you a whole different idea of, of the concept in air quotes of cultural appropriation, because these were intended to be appropriated and told as an original story. Now, historians later go back and say, oh, we trace that story back to this village in India, you know, but for the people in a small town in a village in Japan, that was a story that their grandparents told them. And that's all, that's how they, that's how they knew 
that story. So what I'm learning from that is that it's one of the ways that cultures get tied together is through people uh, taking stories and realities that were created in one culture and then customizing it to their particular thing. Maybe, you know, it, it's kind of like you'll read in the Bible, they'll say something about corn. They didn't have corn there because it came from the Americas. But somehow the story, the meaning of the story is translated through that, you know. So uh, I, I find these things like jackalopes and, and different um, creations and creatures that are made in horror stories to usually make some kind of point about jealousy or rivalry or things like that. They, they have, they withstand the test of time because they adapt and grow from culture to culture. Yeah, that's the key, Lawrence. And your project sounds fascinating, by the way, and it's a great analog to what we're talking about here. But yeah, you're absolutely right that, you know, it's the ability to adapt and change stories that keeps them alive. The, the minute you say that a story can only be told one way, that it can only mean one thing, you've just put an expiration date on it culturally. There's yeah. no way it can survive. And so when we have ghost stories, you know, horror stories, that's a great example, right? There might be a core narrative that gets transmitted from place to place or even generation to generation, but each one gets adapted to reflect the anxieties and fears of people at a particular moment in time. And you know, I, I teach film classes too. And sometimes I'll talk about film remakes and say like, okay, you know, I don't know, James Fenimore Cooper's Last of the Mohicans, it was published in 1823. There are 48 film versions of that novel. Mm. Why do we need 48 different film versions? There's black and white versions. There's silent versions. There's international versions. There's animated versions. Because different people in different places at different times retell that story in a way that speaks to them in that moment. So if you think of that idea of a remake, that's essentially what storytelling is. So with your or my jackalope stories, you know, there's something at the core, but those stories are being told and retold and shaped and adapted by their individual storytellers in ways that speak to what their audience is living through in that moment. And if they didn't, they and they would cease to, to have the power that they do. So I love that idea that uh, these stories are changing all the time. And I love even more the idea that nobody gets to be in charge of the problem. Yeah, that's really fun because everything these days, it seems like, is owned and controlled by somebody. Uh, but, you know, again, go out tomorrow and tell somebody a jackalope story and uh, it's yours and you can make it theirs. Yes. And I think, you know, it says something about life, too, that in life, the the living organisms adapt to their environment, but in the process change their environment. You know, so it's it's like an interchange. And if the organism cannot change to adapt to its environment, it's over, you know, and that's because, the, you know. Yeah, that's right. And then also what's also beautiful about that metaphor, Lawrence, is the organism has to adapt to the environment, but the organism is also always changing the environment in which it lives. Exactly. So like we exactly. need to change those stories to adapt to changing times. But mm -hmm. we can also change those times through the stories that we tell. And I think there's nowhere is that more powerful than uh, when we talk about something like hope, right? If we live in an era where we feel like we're surrounded by despair, uh, we need to tell certain kinds of stories about the world we actually live in. But whether or not we're able to reshape that world in a positive way is also going to be influenced by what kinds of stories we tell about it. So that's right. You know, um, I, I think that that's really important, especially, <clears throat> you know, I'm an environmental writer. As I think about the relationship between humans and the land, I often think that the health of that relationship depends on the kinds of stories we tell about how we see ourselves in relationship to the environment. So we have to adapt to the environment's pressures, but how the environment fares will also depend on what kinds of stories we tell about it. Right. Well, this has been a great conversation. Unfortunately, we're right at the end of it now. I'd like to thank you again for being our uh, guest and also to, to uh, uh, involve us in a conversation about jackalopes 
and what they mean to us all. I think, uh, at least for me, I always get a lot out of these kind of conversations. It makes me reflect on like where in the universe am I anyway? Well, well folks, I'm, ask, I'm asking that too because of your backdrop, Lawrence. So yeah, exactly. That's right. <laughs> and I will change. <laughs> well, Lawrence, thank you so much. This was a wonderful conversation. And thanks also to Colby uh, and to Jennifer, who's doing so much hard work on the festival and Support your state humanities councils. This is such important work, and it was just a great pleasure to be with you guys this morning. All right, and thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time. Same time, same station, brainstorming the human connection. <laughs>